in our series of Westminster Faith Debates. My name is Charles Clark. I have many manifestations in my life. The current one is Visiting Professor of Politics and Faith at the University at Lancaster, in which capacity I've worked with Linda Woodhead, who I'll introduce in a moment, in organizing these debates. We've had six previous discussions raising a wide range of contemporary issues. Religious identity in super diverse societies. What's the place of faith in schools? What have we learned about radicalization? What's the role of religious organizations in an era of shrinking welfare? What are the limits to religious freedom? And what are the main trends in religion and values in Britain? Many of you have attended some or all of these events and I hope you'll agree they've been worthwhile and positive uh, discussions. They've been characterized by the research work that has been done by the Religion and Society Research Program, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council. That program has been going for five years. It's a funding of 12 million pounds altogether. And there are 75 projects which have been sustained by this work. We particularly appreciate the funding of the two research councils, which has made this whole events, uh, series of events possible. If you look at the website of the program, which you can do simply by Googling Westminster Faith Debates, you can find the whole extent of what has been done, the whole range of these programs, the ideas behind it, and what has happened. And I may say we now have uh, on that website a 20-minute video of each of those six previous debates, which we know is already being used as a teaching resource in some places because the debates have been so interesting and worthwhile. So it's been a tremendous series, which I've been absolutely honored and delighted to be associated with, really because as a result of my time in office as Secretary of State for Education and Home Secretary, I became acutely aware of the importance of religion in our society and the need for us to think more clearly about what role it plays in society and how we could address things in a better way. There are a number of people who uh, deserve thanks for making this set of events happen. Firstly, at Lancaster University, Linda Woodhead I'll introduce in a second, Peter Ainsworth, Rebecca Catto, who've been a, the tight team who really have made these all happen, and they've done it tremendously efficiently and well. And at the think tank Theos, Elizabeth Hunter, who's handled all our press and media relations and other organizational work, which has been extremely important. Events tonight, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to pass in a second to Professor Woodhead, we're then going to have about 30 minutes conversation between our three principal guests, and Charles Moore in the center, who Linda will introduce in a moment, has, in addition to his general job, the job of chairing it and provoking an exciting conversation between the rest of you. And I'm sure, Charles, you'll do that with your characteristic acerbity, uh, which will be uh, tremendously uh, valuable. Uh, after that, we'll have 30 minutes for questions for you from the floor, which I will chair. We have to end promptly, I'm afraid, at 6.45 because of the various uh, electronic links. And for those of you who want to tweet from this event, and we've had quite a tweet traffic in the previous events, the hash code is hash WFD12. That's the tweet code if you're of the tweeting fraternity. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Linda Woodhead. She is the Professor in Sociology of Religion at Lancaster University. She's written a large number of books about the place of religion in society and about the history of some of our great faiths. She chairs the panel for the research assessment exercise dealing with uh, these matters uh, over the next few years and is very distinguished in that field. But most important, she's been the director of the Religion Society program, which I mentioned a moment ago. It's her leadership which has made it happen and her inspiration which has made these set of events uh, happen. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Linda Woodhead to introduce the panel and to ask the first question. Linda. Thank you, Charles, and thank you all for being here. I just I kind of want to pause and savour this moment because it's taken a, a lot of organisation and, and time to get here. I first started thinking about a series of public debates to publicize the fantastic research that's been done on my program a few years back now. But many people felt that there was really no appetite for big public events about religion. Who wants to talk about religion? And it was all a little bit dispiriting. 
But I had a hunch, mainly because I spend most of my um, professional life going around talking to people about religion, that actually people love talking about religion, usually when you really want to get out of the taxi. <laughs> Meeting Charles when he was appointed to Lancaster was a fantastic encouragement, and Elizabeth Hunter at Theos was equally encouraging when I first met her. And we found that we were all deeply committed to the idea of raising the level of public debate about religion. But the first time I really thought that this might work was when we organized a question time event at Lancaster University just over a year ago now. And it was on the theme of politics and religion. And in the first half, I asked questions about politics, and it was absolutely fine. But in the second half, we had questions about religion, and the audience just came alive at that point. And I thought, hmm, maybe it'll be okay. So we decided to go for it. We set up a full series of seven serious debates about religion. I actually knew we had to stop at seven because I would run out of outfits by then. I have had <laughs> returned to my, my first one here. So we took a big gamble and we booked expensive venues in Westminster and we just hoped that people might come. If you talk about faith, they will come kind of thing. Well, they did. We hoped we'd get a few people. We got full houses. We hoped we'd get some media coverage. We got all the major dailies, the Standard, the Today programme and so on. And now here we are. We hoped we'd get some old politician. We got an archbishop, an ex-prime minister and a senior journalist. And the point of saying all this isn't to say how clever we are, it's to say there really is an appetite for more informed and serious debate about religion in our public life. So to our speakers. As editor of The Spectator, The Sunday Telegraph and The Daily Telegraph, Charles Moore has always taken issues of religion and morality seriously, and he continues to comment thoughtfully upon them in his writing for The Spectator and the Daily Telegraph. And if any of you have seen the Daily Telegraph today, there's a lovely big feature. Thank you, Charles, for that. Rowan Williams is, of course, the most important face of public religion in Britain, a subject on which he has reflected deeply <laughs> during his time as Archbishop of Canterbury, and on which he has a book due out in September. Tony Blair has never concealed his belief that faith makes a difference to society. In office, he had first-hand experience of the role of faith in conflict and conflict resolution. And since leaving office, he's devoted considerable energy to his faith foundation and various initiatives designed to harness the potential of religion as a force for positive change in the world. As Charles said, then, I'm going to start things off by asking the first question. And actually, it's a question for all three of our guests. It goes first to Charles Moore. Those of you who have been in our previous debates will know that some of the speakers, I'm thinking, for example, of Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, believe that religion has been pushed out of public life, marginalised, even persecuted. Other of our speakers, like Richard Dawkins, think it's not been pushed out far enough. It still has undue influence in government, schools, and so on. So I'd like to ask you, what is your view of how well the UK currently does religion in public life, and what improvements do you think are needed? Charles. Well, Linda, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, just to avoid um, attacks on me, I welcome many attacks, but to avoid one particular attack about bias, I have been given a sort of dual role here tonight, which is to put my own views, but also to be the sort of chairman to move it on. So, so you can't accuse me if I start criticizing them. That's not, I'm allowed to do that. Um, uh, however, I do, I do feel the, the weakest, shortest leg of the stool, obviously. Um, on my left is a gentleman whose formal title is Most Reverend, and on my right is a gentleman whose formal title is Right Honourable, and I'm just a journalist, and therefore neither honourable uh, uh, nor reverend. Um, uh, but um, I will try to put the, uh, the view of the media here. Many others will criticize the media, no doubt, in the course of the evening. So, and many of their criticisms uh, will be just. So I won't um, 
rush forward with those criticisms, you can do that. Uh, and I will just say one thing that we in the media tend to find frustrating about um, organized religion in this country when we're trying to report it. And that is that, that the more organized the religion is, the, the less keen it seems to be on clear communication. And um, uh, I think there's a sort of embarrassment about encountering the modern media, which is very understandable because we are terrible, but um, uh, is also a great loss because uh, Christ says uh, in what's called the Great Commission, go ye out in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, one of that, and that is, among other things, a great media uh, mission. And so it was from the beginning, and you could say that the four gospels are, among other things, uh, marvelous pieces of extended journalism. So um, there's a bit of a challenge to the, uh, the most reverend archbishop uh, on that point. Um, but I want to just ask, what, what is the really important thing about what we're de debating tonight? And there's a little quotation from Gibbon in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire when he talks about religion in the ancient world. And he says, it's a famous quotation, he says, the various modes of worship were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. In other words, um, if you were clever it, clever, it was all a pile of rubbish, but it was socially useful to have it there, um, and uh, you, um, it, it helped the social glue. Now, the reason he was able to say that was because the people in those days, pre-Christianity, didn't make great claims about their religion. They just practiced it, and their religion was very, very commingled with other religions or bits and pieces. With the coming of Christianity, and obviously it's equally true of Islam, um, uh, comes what Mr. Blair in an interview in the Telegraph this morning calls an exclusive truth claim. That's to say, um, there's something about this thing which is not only true, but is the only true thing, or the only important true thing, or the most true thing. And once you have that, it becomes much harder to establish the gibbon um, peacefulness that he describes. Because people, if you think it's a matter of life and death, and more than life and death of salvation, then you have to maintain it, and you have to maintain it at all costs, and sometimes against the law and against great enemies. There's a thing called the Church of England, which very cleverly has dealt with this over the years by taking a lot of the sting out of it. But now we have a um, society which is not predominantly Christian. It's much harder for it to do so and if, because it's multi-faith and because there are militant atheists and in the case of the multi-faith in particular because there is militant Islam. So we have extremely different circumstances. I think everybody on the panel believes that there is a very important role for religion in the public life and in social life uh, to the benefit of the country. But how on earth do we make it work when we have these competing truth claims? That's enough. Over to the Most Reverend Archbishop. I'm still trying to work out what particular media outlets would be sympathetic to the four Gospels at the moment, but that's perhaps a rather longer question. Um, I want to come at it from a slightly different angle, which you touched on, Charles, in your last remarks, speaking very much from the point of view of the Church of England. I think the position of religion in public life is not obviously just a matter of column inches or whatever. I think it's very much how it works on the ground in localities. That's where I, I start thinking about it. Last weekend, I spent in, in Gloucestershire on a pastoral visit to the diocese, and on Sunday morning was in Colford, some of you will be aware that the appalling killing last week by a father of his three children was a Colford family. So I had the opportunity of seeing on the ground what the church was actually capable of doing in a deeply traumatized community. It remains true in ways that are, I think, very surprising to some who only come at this at second hand. It remains true that the church is where people want to put a lot of their emotion, a lot of their otherwise unmanaged feeling and suffering, as well as celebration in other circumstances. It was the vicar who organized the Book of Condolence. It was the local clergy who went into the schools and spoke with children and their parents. And I think I could, I could parallel that in any number of communities across the country. Just as last 
last summer at the time of the riots, it was the local churches and other faith communities who rallied round in many areas to provide, for example, tea-making facilities for firemen and support for the emergency services. So at that level, I actually feel that the, the outreach, the presence, and at one level, I take your point about other things, at one level, the communication of the churches is quite effective. A lot of people still seem to know what they're there for, even if they wouldn't be able to put any vocabulary around it that would pass muster from a theologian's point of view. But it still has that sort of holding capacity, just as in some communities it has what I'd call a, a brokering capacity. It's able to get people around a table to, to look at issues of shared concern. And I think that's one of the areas in which the presence of religious communities increasingly visibly, I think, in the aid and development world is of significance. It struck me a lot in the last couple of years how very, how very many faith-related or faith-based development agencies there are, not at all exclusively directing their attention to members of their own faith, but able in many circumstances to work very effectively together because they have the grassroots access. And I believe that's something we ought to be working to promote and deepen myself. Tony Blair. First of all, thank you very much for, for having me here, the, the, this, this debate. I, actually, I can never come back into this uh, room without a wave of apprehension, since uh, um, apart from the fact that we did the Clause 4 change in the Labour Party here, but it was also, <laughs> I got a very early lesson in politics when John Smith, who was then the head of the industry team of the Labour Party, couldn't do a meeting here and sent me, deputized me to go along in his, his stead. And he said, oh, it's just a little meeting in a room in Westminster Hall. And I went along here and actually it turned out to be this room and not with the four people he told me would be there, but with the 400. And it was on the trademark, it was something to do with trademark and trademark descriptions. And I remember saying to the organizer, I know absolutely nothing about this. To which she replied, you're a professional politician, aren't you? Does that really make a difference? Uh, and, <laughs> It's, um, so, anyway, it's nice to be back here, um, <laughs> debating something else about which uh, some may say I, I know very little, but I try. Um, I think the way I would look at this question is this. For, for, for some people, they feel that religion should be shoved out of the public debate altogether. And, you know, there are many eminent philosophers, John Rawls amongst them, who would say you really should not be able to advance the argument in the public sphere based on your faith. Um, and then, of course, there are others who would say that religion should be able to determine the outcome. Now, as <laughs> it's perhaps a, rather a parody to talk about it as a third way, but I would be... Uh, what I would say is this. I think what we need is a combination of what I call... Um, religion-friendly democracy and democracy-friendly religion. And what that means, I think, is that people within our democratic space accept that people of faith are, um, have the right to articulate their views and articulate them on the basis that they're driven to do that by their faith. And so it is, a, in my view, completely justifiable for people to advance a particular point of view on particular issues of the day and advance that view because they feel impelled to do so as a result of religious conviction. On the other hand, I think it is in the essence of democracy that it is pluralistic, um, that those people who advance that view, even though they do so from deep-rooted religious conviction, have to accept that the views of others, including non-religious people, are equally valid. And we have all to accept that there is a common space, um, and in that common space, we agree that we ultimately decide this through the proper processes of the law, uh, it's parliament and the, the courts. And I think, therefore, there is a way in which you can harmonize both the desire of people to speak out on issues that concern them deeply because of their faith, and also to value and appreciate the work that religious communities do in our society, since I think that work is extraordinary and considerable. I think one of the tragedies of the way we look at religion today is that because we often engage with religious issues around questions of conflict or questions of hot controversy, we forget that day in, day out in societies like ours, um, people of religious faith in places not very far from here do the most extraordinary selfless work that frankly no one else would do. 
and without them, uh, the people who are desperately in need would go without. So I think we need to, to be able as a society to value and appreciate those of faith and, and, and allow them to, to voice their concerns and speak their mind. But I think it's important for people of faith, particularly in a society in which there are many faiths and people who have no faith, um, that we accept there are a set of rules as to how we determine decisions. Now, I used to come across this in a sharp way, obviously, as prime minister, because occasionally the positions that would be taken up by the faith community, even the faith community of which I was a part, I would disagree with. Um, I always absolutely defended their right to speak, but was emphatic that in the end we had to have the proper processes of parliament and the law to decide things. And so I think and hope that it is possible today to come to that kind of mutual sense of understanding. And just the final point I make by way of opening is this. That one of the reasons why I think this is so important is that out there in the rest of the world, particularly in, in the Middle East where I, I spend a lot of my time, um, they are now moving towards democratic systems, which is great and valuable and long overdue. On the other hand, it is very important because of the power of religion in these societies that we do articulate what the right relationship is between religious faith and democracy so that people feel that their faith is safeguarded and allowed to play its part, but also that they understand that there is, in the end, something essentially pluralistic about the concept of democracy, which means that religion should have its proper place, but in the end, the processes of democracy must be supreme in the ultimate decision-making. Well, thank you very much. Of course, um, you spoke of Parliament and the courts, and I expect most people here would, would say that you're right, that Parliament and the courts should decide matters in, in the public sphere. But one of the problems that believers have uh, now is that Parliament and the courts have passed a lot more things that are highly hostile to what they believe. And this isn't only in particular subjects, it's actually systematic because it's to do with the idea of universal human rights as, as interpreted by essentially secular judges. So there are all sorts of things which um, would have been assumed to be, uh, uh, because we were a basically Christian society, would have been assumed to be uh, all right, which are then said not to be all right. A lot of things to do with homosexuality, for example, and uh, some things to do with marriage. There's the gay, gay, gay adoption case. Um, another would be everything to do with education, because there was a pretty wide assumption that um, you should teach your religion in schools, and this was broadly good for children. Now there'll be a lot of people who say that this is indoctrination, and um, this is actually bad for children. You know, somebody like Richard Dawkins would say it's actually toxic for children, that it's, sort of, it's a form of child abuse to baptize children, he would say, because they have no say in the matter. Um, uh, and there is, a, I think many believers feel there's a, there's a framework of law and custom now which is against them. Um, because you just spoke, uh, Mr. Barrow, I'll come back to you, but perhaps I'll put that first to the Archbishop. How do you see that as, um, you know, you, you must see the extent to which uh, people of faith feel victimized, and I wonder how much you agree with this. I see the extent to which people of faith feel victimized or marginalized. I'm not sure they always see it clearly. I think that a few extremely difficult areas and a few extremely hard cases have created a, a slightly um, highly colored view of, of where we are. I think the challenge is to reconnect the discourse of human rights with some of its own religious roots because I'd say boldly, there wouldn't be a discourse of human rights unless there had been a theology. Because the notion that human beings have innate dignities, all human beings have innate dignities, is, is not a self-evident one. It's not one that just comes from secular sources as a matter of historical fact. So I think it's very important to not to let religious discourse and the language of human rights drift apart as if they were intrinsically opposed. There are going to be conflicts and there are going to be issues as there are already in rights discourse, of which kinds of rights trump others in certain circumstances. And I think we're in for a very long and very complicated set of arguments about that, not least in some of the areas that you described. But I'm just a little wary of jumping too quickly into the victim posture here. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, we have, as religious communities, we have access to the public sphere, as Tony has said, 
we can be visible and audible in public discourse. And I would say that over the last, I don't know, the last decade or so, the recognition that religious motivation is really significant across the board for an awful lot of people has made it perhaps a little bit less disreputable to talk about some of these things in public than once it might have been. I don't say it's easy. It's certainly contested fiercely. Um, you have the, the Richard Dawkins phenomenon, certainly. And you have some people who believe that religion is essentially a private matter which ought not to intrude into public discourse. But there is, as we've been reminded, a difference between saying religious considerations ought to be audible and visible in public discourse and saying, therefore, you have the right to expect them always to be obeyed or signed up to because we, we don't have that right in a democracy. That's absolutely correct. But if you, I mean, it's because of our history, we think, for example, that there should be, or many people think there should be Christian and other religious schools, and indeed there are many. But in many civilized societies, it would be, it's actually against the law for there to be such schools paid for by the state, uh, you know, in France and in the United States, for example. Um, what makes you confident, Tony Blair, that um, we, we've got this right, that, um, that, that, it, that it should be this way? I'm, I'm, you say nice things about religion, but I'm not actually quite sure why, given the sort of reforms you've introduced, um, you do think it's a good thing. I mean, there's a religion of human rights in a secular modern way, and it's sort of different from recognizable religion. What, right, what do you, why, are you, why are you stuck on religion? Why didn't you just let it go, sort of put it in a little box and get on with modern life? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think I would distinguish between two separate things. You see, I think, for example, in relation to faith schools, I would argue that from experience, we, we are able to, to make the case that faith schools contribute to our society. Um, you know, my own children have attended faith schools, and that was done as a matter of choice, and I don't regret it. Now, I very much wanted and want th that their religious education in those schools, by the way, should not be so exclusivist, if you like, that they don't then learn about other faiths and other, other people, and, and by and large they have and they do. Um, but I think that's, I would separate that then from this very tricky issue, which is how do you resolve a situation in which, for example, someone says, look, my religion doesn't simply impel me to speak, it impels me to act or not to act in a particular way. Right. Now, I, I once wrote a, a pamphlet uh, as why a Human Rights Act in Britain was a very bad idea. Um, and then I introduced it as Prime Minister. Uh, so, which may just be the power of changing your mind or age or something, but I, I came to the conclusion in the end that actually a human rights debate where the right of people to act in a particular way set against the, what other people felt their right was to either gain a service or to, to behave differently, that it was so impossible to resolve this just as a sort of power clash between two separate views that actually there was something sensible in having a judicial consideration in which this might be where there was an obvious clash of, of rights for, for that, that clash of rights to be resolved. And I I think that's one of the inter interesting things about the US system at its best, in fact, that their constitution does allow them uh, a forum in which people can put their point of view and someone in the end has got to make a judgment. Mm. And I think it's at least arguable that it's as rational to make that judgment through that judicial process as to throw it into the, simply the parlamentary arena. Can, can mm. come back briefly mm. on that. Uh, because I'm, I'm interested, obviously, in the, the question of religiously-based schools. And I think one of the things that, that helps the system to work in this country is, of course, partnership between the state and religious communities, including the churches, which means that the churches or other religious communities are not free simply to set their own standards in such schools. They have to comply with what the state mm. requires for the basic elements of education. That's good, I think, on both sides. And so long as that partnership is there, it means that there is a sort of joint responsibility for standards. <coughs> the state recognizes there's a legitimate role for religious communities. The religious communities recognize that they're not allowed just to opt out of everything. And that 
that's a bit of a key, I think, to how it might work in other areas. It's, for example, significant that we have the conscientious opt out in the practice of abortion, for example, which recognizes that a medical professional has personal convictions which the state democratically respects. It recognizes that those convictions cannot be exercised in such a way as to block someone's access to what the law guarantees for everybody. So the personal opt out, but if you like, a systematic provision. And that's, that's a careful balance, which I think rightly respects the consciences of some and does not force people to act against those consciences, which I think is, is key here. Can I get on to the exclusive truth claim point? Um, you've both had to deal with this in many ways, not just in this country, but, but, but abroad. Um, after 9-11, um, you, Tony Blair, and many others kept jumping up and saying, Islam is a religion of peace. Um, and it struck me at the time that you, wouldn't, you didn't feel the need to get up and say Methodism is a religion of peace, um, because nobody really doubted whether it was or not. Um, but there was a sort of fairly serious uh, problem about whether or not Islam was a religion of peace. Um, the, the question then became the distinction between extremists, um, fanatics, and the, the idea of a great historic faith. How, how easy is it to maintain that distinction, and how much... Um, do you think that one can speak of Islam as just uh, a, an important contribution to um, the whole dialogue of faith and uh, the life of this country? And how much is it um, a tremendously difficult problem uh, because so many Muslims do believe in uh, a sharia, the archbishop's given some credence to this, in a sharia which is a law that um, s uh, supervenes over national law. Um, and therefore Not suggests. Quite what I said, actually. Well, uh, I please say it. what you did say. But, but um, uh, and I know you've had some anxieties about this, Tony Blair, because you've rather revised your opinion. How, how do you reconcile? You're trying to be ecumenical, open, inclusive, and plural, and you're dealing with a problem which, in some ways, is the opposite. Well, first of all, let's be clear that there would have been a point of time in history when you also had to say that Christianity is really a religion of peace, since the practice of Christianity was at certain points in our history, very obviously against um, peace. And um, I was coming across a little story about um, when John Calvin first started preaching and there was a, um, a preacher who came from Spain to his, um, to his city and disputed the, the Holy Trinity. And there was a great debate as to whether he should be burnt at the stake or beheaded, uh, and in the end Calvin graciously said he, he should be beheaded, but so that was taken as a very merciful act. But I mean, it, it shows you that, you know, we, we, all, uh, we all have lived in our own history with, with times when our religion is, has been used as justification for violence. Now I think, I mean, I personally believe very strongly that at its roots, Islam is indeed a religion of, of peace and peaceful coexistence. But I think what, what, what we need to work out is how do we create a situation in which, with every religion having, in a sense, its truth claims, right? Because I'm a Christian, I believe in salvation through Jesus Christ, that is, my, that is my faith. How do we reconcile having that truth claim with the fact that someone else will have a, a different one? Now, I personally believe there, there is a very simple and obvious way that we can do this, which is, is, is j just to recognize, and in a way, almost recognize that it would be very arrogant in relation to God's purpose for us, simply to assume that others can't think as they do and think very sincerely and differently. And what, the reason why I believe so passionately in the interfaith um, process, and I know Rowan's done a lot of this in his time as Archbishop of Canterbury, is because I think when people start to come together across the faith divide, they don't give up their own faith, but they start to understand more about the other. They start to realize that, by the way, there are many common things we, we, we share, particularly so of the Abrahamic faiths, but also actually stretching across all the main faiths. And, you know, this is a, a simplification, but we're in a short debate, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But I think there is a, you know, what I notice in the world today is two 
types of religious feeling in a way. One is a religious feeling where your faith drives you to acts of compassion in the service of others. And you see that in, across all the faiths. And the other is a, a feeling where faith becomes a badge of identity, almost in exclusion to others. And I think those, that, 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 I know that's to simplify it, but I notice everywhere I go in the world, these two mm. things mm. jostling with each other. Mm. And I think the importance of creating a, a, a strong interfaith dialogue is to say, look, where there is more understanding and more knowledge, there's less likely to be conflict. Where there's ignorance, there's often fear. Mm. And one of the things I think is really important, you see, I personally believe in our school system, it is important not to teach people they have to be religious, but to teach them about the nature of religion and one of the things that I think is important for people growing up in this world today is to be religiously literate, and therefore to understand, particularly in a society like ours, where you've got many different faiths um, living side by side with each other, to understand what is it that moves them, what makes them tick, because otherwise you end up with, I'm afraid, very seriously misconceived views of what particular faiths are about. And in the work that we do, sometimes we come across in different countries, and my faith community foundation is about 20 different countries, you look at some of what people are educated to about someone else's faith, sometimes, by the way, in perfectly good faith, mm -hmm. which is shocking mm -hmm. in terms of its description of what mm -hmm. the other person's faith is really about. So, you know, that's how I think you make sense of this. You're not going to, people aren't going to yield up their sense that their own faith is the right way to salvation. But we have to find the humility and then the, the process in which we recognize that, that it is right to acknowledge that other people have a different view, have been brought up in a different tradition, and that tradition has equal validity, and they have equal validity as human beings within society as ours. Now, we may not regard theirs as the right way, but we should regard them as no lesser a human being as a result of them having that view. Yes, Archbishop, please follow on. Can I just follow on quickly? What, how do you deal with the people um, who don't agree with that. That's to say, the people who say, no, you, you know, your faith is rubbish, um, mine's true. I mean, how, how does this accommodate with this very attractive world that attitude that Tony Blair paints? The problem of most interfaith dialogue is that you're talking to the people who are ready to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. And how you get to talk to the people who don't want to talk to you is, of course, a major challenge. Um, that's why part of the the purpose and the hope, I think, of interfaith dialogue is so to engage people and enthuse and motivate the people you are talking to that they're willing to pursue certain kinds of conversation within their own um, faith families that open it up a little bit further. Now, that's a slow process, but I've good reason to think it does happen. If, for example, and I'm thinking of, of a real instance here, you can have a conference at which we have, you have um, a fairly senior Islamic jurist from a Muslim-majority country. We get into a quite deep debate about um, the application of Sharia and whether it is precisely what um, even the most expert jurist thinks it is, whether there's more disagreement, more argument to be had. Some of that will go back into a conversation in the Islamic institution that that jurist belongs to. Yeah. And as I say, I've, I've seen that happen in one or two particular instances. Mm. One or two specific points, if I may, following on. One is that I agree very much about the, the information that's given about the other. And one of the most effective and important grassroots things that interfaith discussion can do, I think, is to get some agreement on looking at each other's textbooks. What, what do we actually say about each other? Is it fair? Is it presented in the terms that the other would recognize? Mm -hmm. And it's been a little bit of a step forward in the Holy Land and some of our discussions there with the Council of Religious Leaders in Jerusalem mm -hmm. to get a policy statement about doing just that work on textbooks, shared work on textbooks mm -hmm. across the pitch. So I think that's, that's a, a significant practical short-term mm -hmm. step. Mm -hmm. One last observation, if I may, on this, and that's, I suppose that it's fundamentally a spiritual problem that we're talking about. The spiritual problem 
of a lot of religious people assuming that they have to win God's arguments for him. <laughs> and you can't rely on God to, to be God. And somehow, if you lose the argument, if you lose the battle, if you lose the controversy, mm. then somehow God loses. Mm. And that seems to me such a preposterous <laughs> religious position to be in. <laughs> and yet it's, it's one that some people seem to, seem to take for granted in the way they work. There's a very, very interesting, rather forgotten play by Charles Williams about my predecessor, Thomas Cranmer, mm. um, in which Cranmer, who is clearly in the play a mouthpiece for Charles Williams's variety of rather quirky 20th century Anglicanism, Cranmer says, I must not try to, to be God in this. And that means sometimes I'll fail. Yes. But to say that is a recognition, if you like, of the majesty and supremacy of the God you believe in. It's not an acknowledgement of weakness on God's part. Yes, I, I suppose sometimes people just feel, you know, poor old God, he's been so battered by everybody, we've got to stick up for him. And exactly. it's, uh, <laughs> um, they can go too far. I think he um, can look after himself uh, yeah, yes. on that. <laughs> yes, it, was, it wasn't of some Jewish boy who said, um, Rabbi, I don't believe in God anymore. And um, the rabbi said, do you think he cares? What he did. Um, thank you. I, that my my, my um, role of keeping order now ceases because it goes back to Charles. It's ten past six, so it's now, um, or, to, or to Linda, it's now to Charles. It's now questions um, to the floor. Perhaps you could, uh, halfway point, thank these two uh, <laughs> gentlemen for our, um, Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree we've had an excellent start to the evening, really a most interesting dialogue. It's now over to you, because all these debates, have uh, we've conceived them as being a chance for people who have attend as you to ask questions of our panel, and I think that's an important part of what we do. We've got about half an hour for that. I'm going to take questions in groups of three and then come to the panel. So can I see indications of who'd like to ask questions. I see the gentleman in the middle with the uh, white hair and white beard first there. And then I see the lady up front here. This gets very dangerous after a time. It does get painful. I'm going to take the gentleman right at the back with the glasses. So first of all, the gentleman with the silver beard and silver hair looking very distinguished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is the working yet? Um, I'd like to go back to... Uh, beg your pardon. Could you just introduce yourself as you... I, I was going to do so. Um, uh, I'd like to go back to Mr. Blair's initial contribution uh, in which uh, he talked about people with religion coming into the public square. I, as a humanist, and I'm David Pollock, and I was until a few weeks ago the president of the European Humanist Federation, I also come into the public square with what you might call my face. I don't call it that. Uh, uh, and so I'm entirely sympathetic to the idea that people must be allowed to come into the public square motivated by their faith. Uh, what I'd like to ask is whether Mr. Blair recognizes uh, that there should be a self-denying ordinance beyond that, though, uh, that in coming into the public square, motivated in such a way, you should not have a program that is to enforce your religion or to enforce uh, concepts that can only be justified by religion, that the arguments you should put should be arguments that can be recognized by everyone in society. Thank you. The lady at the front here. School of Economics and Inform. Um, could I ask whether there are certain religions which it would be unsafe or inadvisable for the government or the established church to dialogue with? Thank you. And it was the gentleman back there. That's right. Yep, that's it. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. Sorry, my name is Gareth Wallace. I'm the policy advisor for the Salvation Army. Um, just today, the churches have been speaking out about gambling and the government's uh, gambling legislation, which Mr. Blair's government passed. So I was wondering if he could reflect on how his faith influenced how that came about. Right. We were also, of course, covered by the press, and it was interesting to see that on that issue where we were speaking out morally, but also on an issue of policy, uh, whether Mr. Moore could comment on the fact, I think his newspaper covered us, but perhaps on other issues, maybe the journalists wouldn't choose to cover us. 
And then finally, with uh, the Archbishop, we were extremely grateful the time that the Super Casinos came before Parliament, that it was three bishops that caused the uh, casino, the Super Casino to be rejected. And I mused at the time, wasn't it remarkable that we had to rely on the bishops in the House of Lords to speak out for Christians in politics who wanted to speak up on a moral point, but on an issue of government policy? Thank you. I have three good questions. We're going to go first to Tony, then to Rowan, then to Charles, if that's right, Tony. I, I knew this would get tricky at some point in, the, <laughs> in these proceedings. Um, you know, my attitude on gambling is, fits in exactly with what I've said. I mean, I didn't, frankly, agree with the Salvation Army's position on it uh, for reasons I gave at the time, which is that, that people could gamble online. There's all sorts of ways they could gamble, and therefore I didn't think it wrong to prevent people um, setting up these casinos, and I still think I'm afraid that was the right position, with apologies to you for speaking my mind like that. Um, but, you know, I think that's a classic example of what I'm saying. I, I think that you, you should be absolutely right to stand out there and say, we believe this is a moral issue, we believe you're wrong to do it, as long as you understand that in the end, I, as Prime Minister, should take a decision on what I genuinely believe to be the interests of the country. And I think that's, that's the way democracy should function. Um, in respect of whether there are religious groups we shouldn't dialogue with, I mean, I'm pretty broad-minded, <laughs> but I mean, I guess there might be. Um, and, you know, inevitably in these situations, there's an element of subjective judgment. You know, you, what religious group fits is so far out on the further shores of um, common sense or so on that you, you don't dialogue with it. But, I mean, I, I have to say, I don't think it, in general terms, is a problem for government dialoguing with religious groups. And even if people, if, if, even if you profoundly disagree with what they're saying, I think they're still got a right to express their view. Now, sometimes there may be groups that are, you actually believe are harmful in some way. That's a different issue. But, but in general terms, I adopt a fairly uh, broadly liberal position. And in respect of the question on, on Self humanism. Huh? Self-restraint. Well, I think there is a really important thing here, which is um, the quality of the discourse is also important. In other words, you know, all of these issues that we are going to talk about, I mean, if you, you take an issue like abortion, for example, which is incredibly controversial and difficult, and in which people feel very, very strongly indeed. The quality of the discourse, I think, is very, very important. That people accept there can be, because I think this is necessary, you know, I think this is in a broader sense, actually, about the way we conduct politics. It's necessary for people to understand that reasonable people can disagree. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you disagree with each other. And I think that, therefore, I don't think there should be any restraint on religious people putting forward their view and saying, I'm doing this because I actually believe it to be part of my religious belief. I think they're absolutely entitled to do that. And I think that they do not have to say, here are a set of objective humanist reasons why this is also right. They can say, look, I happen to believe this is a matter of faith, and that's it. But I think the quality of the discourse and the way it's conducted is really, really important. And you know, one of the things that I... Um, uh, think a lot about in the, my sort of political afterlife, as it, as it were, is how do you improve the quality of democracy? In other words, you know, we think a lot about the form of democracy, you know, the voting and parliamentary system. How do you improve the, the quality of it? And one way of improving it is to say there are genuinely different views that people will hold strongly as a matter of conviction, and they should express them in a way that doesn't intimidate other people or make other people feel frightened of coming forward and saying what they think. And I, I think that sort of, if you like, slightly prosaic but basic common sense way of conducting yourself is probably the best way to conduct these difficult questions because the people will never, dis never agree on them. I mean, there's never going to be a point of agreement. What there has to be is a way of having a modus operandi for having the debate and then a method of resolving it, which should be, in my view, objective and actually in essence, secular. Thank you, uh, Tony Rohn. I think it's very important indeed that we have um, a, what I've sometimes called a properly argumentative democracy. In other words, one where real public argument of high quality is, is routine. 
drawing in a wide range of motivations. But let me come to the specific questions. Um, Eileen's first, if I may. Um, there are different kinds of dialogue and different kinds of engagement. And there's virtually nobody that I, I would feel we ought not to talk to. But there are questions, I think, about how much legitimacy you want to give to some groups if there are groups, if there are groups who have what you might call a proven record of internally abusive or corrupt behavior. You don't particularly want to deal particularly with a leadership that is compromised by a solid record of bad behavior. And we know there are some religious groups like that. I guess some would draw the net quite widely there, but um, that's, that's my baseline, I think. If there is a group where there is, as I say, a proven record of internal abusive or corrupt behavior, I would not want to give any extra credence to that by publicly engaging, sharing a platform. On the other hand, there are other kinds of dialogue, there are other kind, kinds of more private engagement. We find ways of doing that. I, the other two questions seem to me in a way connected because looking back to that um, notable afternoon in the Lords where I, I was one of the bishops who voted, I put my hand up on that because I did think, saving your presence, that the idea that you could regenerate an impoverished area of Manchester by importing a super casino seemed to me utterly, utterly bizarre. Um, and and I, haven't changed, I haven't changed my mind. But, but it seems to me that the kind of argument we had on that occasion was one where it might well be quite important to say at some point, well, I'm saying this because of who I am, where I'm coming from. But the details of the argument have to be addressed in pragmatic as well as broad moral and ideological terms. And that's true, I think, over a, a range of issues. It's certainly the way in which a number of discussions about assisted dying have gone in the public sphere. In other words, I may come at it with a, a strong set of religious convictions which actually dictate my view on this. If I have an argument about this in the public sphere, I can't expect somebody else to accept the authority of where I start from. And I have to be a bit bilingual, let's say, in, mm -hmm. in that. So I'm not it's not exactly self-restraint. Self-restraint to the extent of saying, I'm not expecting you to agree with me just because I say I believe it and I believe it because my faith tells me to. Now, that is, as a matter of fact, where I come from, but let's, let's see where we get on ground that is not um, exclusively determined by that. And I think those arguments are, are possible to have and they're important to have well, you know, conducted with clarity and, and charity. And I would even go so far as to say there's a theological reason for this, that if I do believe that um, assisted dying or gambling or various other things are not in accord with God's will for human beings, um, well, of course, there'll be pragmatic arguments against them because they're not going to work, are they, if human beings are not made for that kind of goal? But that's, that's a sort of quiet theological parenthesis here. <laughs> mean, meanwhile, I would want to have have the argument. Um, actually, I don't think it is a quiet theological uh, um, parenthesis. I think okay. it's, I think it's rather on. important, because one of the things that's very, very annoying about public policy today is that the people who make it don't understand that all these questions have been debated before. And, and religion has been debated, uh, debating them for literally thousands of years and has developed a wisdom about it which is applicable to, to some extent to everybody. And so in the question of gambling, it's very difficult to know exactly what law you should make or not make. But it is a very important point that gambling is a very dangerous activity for human beings. And my goodness, we're seeing that in the banking world today. <laughs> um, and if you have in your head this religious knowledge and religious tradition, it informs the debate so much better. And I would uh, apply this also to the, actually the question of um, literally, physically, and historically, the public square. Just outside is the most well-known public square in this country. And it is surrounded by buildings which represent the law and uh, parliament, the people who are elected, uh, and the church. And in the, ch the church predates all the rest of them, Westminster Abbey, and it's, the, it's what's technically known as a royal peculiar. It's where the, our head of state is crowned. So if you want to understand anything about this country, 
and how we think about things. When you leave this hall today, you should just walk around the square and have a look at it. See what came first and how what came second related to what came first and what came third related to what came second. And remember that, among other things, the chamber of the House of Commons of all places um, was actually the seating arrangement based on the fact that before um, it, the House of Commons was burnt down in 1834, uh, it had been St. Stephen's Chapel. And that's why that, that chamber had been a chapel. And that's why it's in that form. It's all there coming through the whole time in the history. And our public affairs are so ill-informed now that everybody thinks they can make it up from scratch. Uh, and I think it was a particular, if I may say so, awful thing about New Labour, that they, for all sorts of internal reasons, they wanted to pretend that nothing in, had ever happened in British history before 1997. <laughs> <laughs> um, Charles, Charles, can I just ask you... Uh, um, that was a, that was a very right, good right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just ask you, Charles, just talk a bit more about the media in general on this issue of self-restraint. Uh, I thought, for example, that the decision of British newspapers not Would to publish... Would you just give an illustration? <laughs> 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 not to publish the, not to publish the uh, uh, Danish cartoons was a very interesting decision of self-restraint by the British newspapers at that time. But the, news, the, the newspapers and the media generally are a very important part of this public square in how they cover these kinds of difficult questions. Do you have any general reflections, uh, not particularly from a Telegraph point of view, but from the media as a whole, how they deal with these things or how we could better relate Sorry, to what the media? Things, religious things? Or religious things generally. The issues of particular groups you shouldn't talk to, of sensationalising particular beliefs in, in particular ways highlighting particular issues like gambling in certain ways. Is there other ways in which you think the media could be thinking better about these questions than they do now, or do you think there's not much to worry about, really? I think there's a lot to worry about, but I think two things come into conflict. One is the need to be charitable, and we're very uncharitable. And if you look at local newspapers, they're completely different. They're very charitable. They try to uh, tell the good news, and after all, Christianity speaks of the good news, and we tell the bad news. On the other hand, we the national papers. On the other hand, it is the national pa papers' uh, job to cause some trouble and ask difficult questions. And to, when Mr. Important Pompous Person stands up to laugh at him and suggest that he might be a hypocrite or whatever, and one has to try and keep these things in balance. It is, it, it, we can't be too, we ought to try to be good and we fail, but we ought not to be goody goody. And in that sense, we're not part of the establishment, and it remains our duty to cause some trouble. Thank you. OK, I'm now going to go to the next set of three. I've got a lady in there with dark black hair. You, that's right, you, one. I've got the lady here, uh, just down there. That's you. And I'm going to go to the back. The gentleman uh, with black hair just in front of the microphone there. So first of all, uh, the first. Good evening. I'm Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner. I'm the rabbi to the reform movement. And uh, you talked about religion having looked at many issues for years and years. But the issue that seems that's not been risen, raised tonight is the issue of women clergy. So I'd love to know if there's something new that you've discovered recently in the debates. Thank you. <laughs> lady, lady here. Um, my name is Rebecca, and I'm an English teacher in East London. Um, in the interest of interfaith dialogue, I would like to know how beneficial or detrimental the panel thinks the politicised gesture of handing out a King James Bible by the Education Secretary to every school in the country is for the young citizens of our country. Thank you. And the gentleman at the back there, that's right, you. Yeah. Um, hi, um, my name's Paul. I'm from Brunel Psychology. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, it's, it's a personal thing really about uh, reconciliation, not, not in the religious sense, but how, um, given all we know about uh, modernity, the modern life, the advances we've made in uh, science and technology, how you can reconcile this with uh, some central tenets of your religion, which I believe involve um, a lowly carpenter's son 2,000 years ago rising from the dead, and you know, a, a process which is physiologically impossible. And I was just wondering, you know, if, if this creates a dichotomy in your mind and how, how it's resolved when given all that we know um, in, in our advancements that, you know, this, this remains impossible and, and how you uh, sort of reconcile that. Thank you. I'm going to go in reverse order, so to Charles, then to Rowan, then to Tony. Charles. I didn't see why it's harder for a lowly carpenter to rise from the dead than you, the slight implication that it might be easier for someone posher. I, <laughs> um, uh, uh, it's, of course, it's impossibility is, of course, um, 
why it's believed. That sounds a paradoxical remark, but um, it, it's, the faith depends on the fact that something happened that only happened once and could never happen again, and the um, doctrine of the incarnation and so on. So um, the fact that you find it hard to believe is not in itself um, a disproof of it. The, on the King James Bible, um, on the women priests, by the way, I, take, I want to take advantage of the fact that I, don't, I have no standing in the matter and uh, avoid answering it. But on the, um, on, on, on the King James Bible, um, the, the questioner said, that Rebecca, I think, said it was a um, politicized gesture. And I think that's right. And I would say it was a good politicized gesture because the um, King James Bible was, among other things, an, a vital political act which helped unite the Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England and helped to forge um, the United Kingdom and became the, the key text of our social order. Um, and it's this historical point, but it's not a sort of dusty historical point, it's a real historical point, that this uh, is an essential part of how we come to be what we are and why we believe what we believe. And it wasn't just Michael Gove who, who did this, uh, in the, her broadcast for Christmas the year before last, the Queen devoted, because it was the 400th anniversary, most of her broadcast to this subject and for this very reason. So I don't think there should be any apology about that at all. Thank you. Rowan? Um, let's start with uh, the women and clergy question. I think most of the arguments about women and clergy at every level have, have been had in the last 20 years and more and I wouldn't have expected a great deal new to emerge at the level of argument. What I think is emerging is a couple of things. One is certainly the last round that we've had of discussion in the Church of England. I think the bishops, have, myself included, have had to learn just how difficult it is for women to hear an all-male body pronouncing on their future. Even with the best will in the world, the bishops making the suggestions they did because they wanted it to happen, and yet somehow that communicated itself in, in a problematic way. Um, I still think myself that we, we had the right general idea, but that's not going to make much difference to those who heard it as offensive and problematic. And that's just a, you know, a general reminder that we are now in a church, as we're in a society, where we expect to hear from people and expect people to be able to say where, what they're feeling about issues as well as what they're thinking and to be heard and taken seriously and to get a, a fuller, more collaborative discussion. We, we go on working at that, but I think the experience of the recent synod was you know, quite challenging for some of us in that way, simply, um, yes, being challenged to listen at another level, whatever we thought we were doing. It's always important to see yourself through other people's eyes, bishops or anybody else. Um, King James Bible, a really interesting question, this, because I love the King James Bible. I would like people to be aware of it, to know their way around it. But my question is, what is it that helps any child in a school in this country know their way around a big, complicated text like that? If you're going to put a big, complicated text into people's hands at a young age, which is not in itself a bad thing, what exactly are you going to do in terms of investing resources and energy in the whole educational establishment to make it possible for the imagination of a child to respond fully to all that that means? In other words, it's not just a question of making a, an iconic gesture, so to speak. It's a matter of saying, what are the conditions that will make this work in a really constructive way, a really educating way? And then the, the last question, Rather like Charles, my, my feeling is, well, you know, they knew resurrection was unusual in the first century. That's why it made a difference. You know? um, and I don't expect to be able to give scientific demonstration of the resurrection or the virgin birth or whatever, because they were from the very beginning seen as extraordinary world-changing exceptions. In other words, there's nothing about Christian faith that says that there's anything provisional about the laws of nature. There's nothing intrinsic about Christian faith that conflicts with a regular scientific worldview of cause and effect. But if you do believe that all of that chain and system of cause and effect has its ground in the eternal 
unconditioned activity of a creative god, then you may be utterly surprised, startled, shattered by a miraculous event, but you won't, you won't see it as completely nonsensical. Thank you. Tony. In respect to the first question, I think the, the actual... I'm going to answer that question very precisely, which was, is there anything that we've heard that's new in this debate? Not really. Uh, it's, it's the very simple way of answering it. Um, and I think this debate will carry on within, your, within the Jewish tradition, within the Christian tradition, and uh, other traditions as well. I th I, but I, I think in the end it's a matter of, 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 of where people stand and what they think about it. Um, in respect of the King James Bible, I mean, I would look upon this not as an act of proselytization. I don't think it was meant in that way at all. It's, it's part of our, our tradition and history as a country, just to show Charles there are history, parts of history and tradition that New Labour takes seriously. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, and, and it's, I think it's, it's good that people understand it, but we're not trying to convert anyone by doing it. I'm sure that's, that's the, the spirit and sense in which it's meant. Um, and the final question, which is, well, it's a long conversation you need to have about that. I, I, for me, the resurrection in the sense of, of um, someone reborn is, is a very important, indeed essential part of the Christian faith. But it, it is where um, you, I think, would have to, have to accept that that is what people who profess the Christian faith believe is a matter of their faith. And um, I think what's important is to understand why we do, the context in which we understand it, what it means to us. And, you know, this is a, a debate that I had from quite an early age, since my, my father, although I, I'm a Christian, my father is, was and remains um, a militant atheist. Um, and so it's a debate I'm well familiar with. But I think rather than try and see this as a debate about um, physiology in some way or, or, bi or biology, just to see it as a, as a debate about what our faith means to us and what it... Um, tells us about the human condition and how we rescue it from um, the very great difficult circumstances the human condition finds itself in. So I would look at it, at it in that way, and I think if you approach it less in the method of a um, sort of laboratory experiment and more in the, in the method of a, a, a conversation about emotional connection and what it, what it means to us to be a Christian, then I think you maybe have a better understanding of why we believe it and why it's so central to our faith. Thank you. Next set of three, I'm going to go first to the cardinal here, next to the gentleman at the back with slightly bald uh, there. So, sorry, it's very rude. Uh, the distinguished, that's right, just there, <laughs> distinguished looking gentleman there, and then to the lady with uh, black hair and glasses on her head, just in the middle right there. So first of all, Cardinal. It seems, it seems to me there are um, two challenges in our society and in all Europe. One is uh, militant secularism, uh, which would want to put religion on the periphery of society. And it seems to me all religions uh, have to sort of combine and say that it's not only wrong but unhelpful for society. But the other one, more dangerous, is militant relativism. And it's already been touched upon by our speakers. Namely, that there's no objective truth. <laughs> that one truth is as good as another. And it seems to me, unless we accept that there is objective truth, which is true for everyone, then there's no point in having any dialogue at all. Because uh, you've got to have something on which you base your, your, uh, your discussion and your dialogue. So. Uh, I suppose uh, in the relationship of religion to public life, um, it seems to me that there are three areas where we, as it were, can interpenetrate in the dignity of the human person, everything that concerns with that, the, the, the themes of society, especially the family, and above all, right, the, the, the role of religion. I mean, I mean, in the beginning of the Bible, God made it made us in his own image and likeness, which is not an obsolete myth, but uh, the clue to meaning. So my, my question is really to our speakers, uh, is how 
do they think in our society today, that we can, uh, rather than condemn, because when you say something is wrong, people say, well, I just don't agree with you. How can we actually promote those things that are right, especially in those areas which touch people? Uh, d dignity of the human person, family, and faith, religion. Uh, and is there, where to come, a new way, a new evangelization, which we as Christians ought to adopt in our country, which I think is crucial for the future. Thank you very much. The gentleman at the back there, that's right, you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Dave Landrum. I'm the Director of Advocacy for Evangelical Alliance. Uh, just a quick one. Um, Tony Blair mentioned that uh, we need to find a dialogic and decision-making process that is, in essence, objective and secular. Well, that doesn't seem to be able to stack up uh, with what we've got in terms of the dominant political discourse, the interpretation and application of human rights law, um, and the problems that Christians are finding right across the public square. Isn't secular neutrality just a myth? It does seem to be. Thank you very much. And the lady there, that's right. Um, Ila Bartok Sen, I'm just an ordinary citizen. Um, and my question is... No one is ordinary. In this, in this push to marginalizing religion outside public life and pushing it to the, to, to the side, have we lost the thought about morality and where morality sits? And do you believe that there is a public morality and a private morality? And how does that transfer into society? Thank you. I'm going to go first to Rowan, then to Tony, then to Charles. Rowan first. Mm. Three questions, again, which, which connect together quite a bit. Let me begin with the last one. Um, is there a difference between public and private morality? I don't think there should be, in the sense that what we think a good person looks like should not be unrecognizably different in the public or the private sphere. But, as we've already said, there are different... Um, different contexts in which different kinds of argument have different levels of force, which is why I may know or believe I know from my faith what a good life looks like. But if I can only appeal to my faith in public discussion, it's not going to make very much impact. I have to look for those other areas of convergence, which is Cormac's question in, in a way too. Um, we are, though, if I can pick up a question from the back, we are in danger, I think, of assuming that morality is self-evident, that there is a, you know, an absolutely obvious default setting which is secular and rational and objective for discussing moral questions. And therefore, what religious people think about human nature or human behavior is just a sort of eccentric extra. That's, that's a tricky one because the fact is, of course, the public morality that people have comes from a wide variety of positions, specific positions that are held, which may be religious, non-religious, anti-religious. And one of my biggest worries is that we're moving into a climate where people seem to assume we all really know what's rational, but unfortunately, a few religious people complicate matters. I, don't, I just don't think that's true. Back to what I was saying earlier about human rights. The language of human rights has religious roots, and people need to be reminded of that. If you accept that the language of human rights depends on a really big act of faith in human dignity, picking up Cormac's language again, then you have at least to grant a little bit of space to the religious person to say, well, you know, the human dignity we're talking about has its foundation not just in secular rational discourse, but some, somewhere deeper which opens up at least the possibility of coming back on some of these public questions. I agree very much with the Cardinal about the question of relativism. We are talking not just about what suits this person or that person, we are talking about what, what makes for a robust, fulfilled human life which lives out the potential God has placed in it. And I think that it's actually that notion of human dignity that is at the root of all those other areas, including why and how families matter, that Cormac mentioned. It's because you believe certain things about human beings that other things follow on. So one of the big challenges, I think, in our discourse at the moment is to work really, really hard at what 
in our trade we call horrifyingly theological anthropology. <laughs> that is, what, what do we think about human beings in the light of God? And very often, the important debates are in, in the public arena are about what we really think of human beings. And, and that's not a matter of you know, optional varieties. While we may disagree, and we may disagree civilly and constructively, it is a matter of what is the case, finally, I think. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a really important set of points here. And let, let me try and say how, how I, I think it should be dealt with from the point of view of a, um, of a policymaker as, it, as, as well as someone who's trying to think about these issues. The first point is I, I totally agree with what Cormac was saying about the, um, the fundamental contribution and importance of um, the notion of basic human rights that are about the dignity of the human being and that are, that are things that can't be sort of relativized away, if you like. I think this is absolutely crucial. I think it's a great part of the contribution of, of religion. Um, now, there will be people who disagree with that position. And by the way, what's very important for people who are of religious faith is to say, you know, it's not that the only people with morality or principles are religious people. Uh, I mean, I know plenty of people who are anti-religious but are very, very decent people and more decent than some of the religious people I know. So it's, it's important we put that down because otherwise I think we, we end up making mistakes here. But I think this notion of, the, of a contribution of religion to the public debate that is to remind people that it's not just a utilitarian transactional relationship between society and its citizens, that there is something basic and fundamental about the dignity of every human being. I actually think that is a huge contribution that people of faith can make to our society, and it's very important that voice is heard. And then what I would say to, to um, David, to, to, in the sense of the last uh, questioner, is that having said that, it doesn't either ultimately resolve all these difficult questions, because they are difficult, by the way, um, and it doesn't tell you how people of religious faith best make their case in society. And in my view, there are, there are three things that it's important that people of faith do in our country today and in similar countries. The first is that we, we are prepared to speak up and speak out from the position of, of faith. In other words, we're not afraid to say, look, this is why we, we, we believe what we believe, and not be embarrassed about it or think there's something strange in, in, in saying that. And, you know, I um, know this well because of the famous um, instruction by my press secretary, we don't, do, we, we don't do God. And I was thinking when the Salvation Army person was talking earlier, I remember the Salvation Army coming to see me when I was leader of the opposition. And there was a, a lady who came to see me, we talked about things, and at the end of it, um, she said, right, we're all going to kneel in prayer. And there were two members of my office who should be nameless, who looked absolutely aghast, being not religious. And, and I said, you're going to have to get on your knees. And, then, <laughs> and I remember one of them said, oh, for God's sake, and I said, exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they... they, they one of the things that, that I loved about meeting such people um, when I was in office was their unashamed proclamation of their faith, and I think that's important. The second thing is that, that it's important we also, from the faith community, tell people about the work that the faith community does. Because otherwise what people hear, and this, by the way, is not really a, an issue to do with the media. You can't expect the media to do sort of great news stories about nice pieces of work happening by uh, religiously minded people, but it is important that people understand the work done here and worldwide. I mean, uh, almost half the healthcare in many parts of Africa is provided by, by churches and increasingly often by organizations like Islamic Relief as well. So these things are fantastically important. And the third thing is that I think when we um, talk about faith, and this is why I, I returned and obviously well, I believe in very passionately, you know, we do show that reaching out to people of, who, who are of a different faith from our own. Because I find one interesting thing is that I find a connection with people who are of faith, even though different faith to my own, precisely because the certain things that we, there's a certain space intellectually, philosophically, and emotionally that we can congregate around. And I think 
Because so often people, and the people who are pushing this aggressive secularism, you know, in a way they have a kind of common cause with people who are very extreme about their own religion. Because provided the face of religion is this extremism, it's easy for the secularists to say, well, I told you, they're all crazy people. You shouldn't listen to them. And that's why I think this, this concept of also reaching out across the faith divide is a very important part of making the faith voice heard properly. Thank you, Tony. Uh, John, I'm very interested that you, you prayed with the Salvation Army people. And um, Jeremy Paxman scornfully asked you whether you prayed with George Bush. Um, but why would it have been wrong if you had? Wouldn't it have been a good thing? Well, perhaps you did pray. Did you pray with him, in fact? It wouldn't have been... <laughs> it wouldn't have been a, a wrong thing. It's just that it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure as a journalist you understand the distinction. Do it next time. <laughs> <laughs> Touché. Um, the, 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 the um, Cardinal Cormac made, made a, a very important point about objective truth, and I was reminded of the very stern um, thing that the Catholic ta Church has taught over the years, which is that error has no rights. That's one of its things that it said. And that must be true that error has no rights, but erroneous people do have rights, and we're all erroneous people, and therefore we all deserve to be treated with charity and respect for our errors, um, uh, because we're all uh, in the same boat. Um, and that leads me on to answer the question from the gentleman who Charles unkindly called the bald man, um, which was... Um, I'm, I'm in a good position. Yes, 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 yes. Pot, <laughs> pot and kettle. The, um, uh, which, which, which was about... And, um, and, which was about neutrality um, in the public space. And I think he made a, a true observation that if you are a practicing Christian, you don't feel any longer that there is neutrality in the public space in this country. And this is particularly true because of the increasing power of judges, and particularly of European judges, to lay down all sorts of things about personal contact, conduct, which under the old English law uh, would never have happened. And what I think we need to think of is how we can have that space more, more kindly dealt with. And we have the answer to hand, in fact. And of course, the Archbishop is too modest to say this, but the fact is that this is a very important part of the modern role of the Church of England. Because the Church of England, for all its manifest deficiencies, is essentially a tolerant place. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think everything you've heard from him, I remember Willie Whitelaw, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher, saying, you must understand, the Archbishop of Canterbury, another one, of course, is a most religious man. Well, <laughs> that, that, that might be a statement to the obvious, but um, the point he was making was that um, here's, here's a place of safety where we can trust these people, and I notice this very much with other faiths and other not Christian denominations, that they feel that here is a warm space in the public sphere where they're not given incredible privileges, but they're feelings and attitudes and problems are understood. And I think this actually matters tremendously and is a source of peace, which is what Christians should always uh, be trying to bring. Um, and so, and I think it's also very true of our monarchy. And the Queen herself said something very interesting about religion in this context the other day, which is by her standards very controversial, really making essentially the point I'm, I'm, I'm making now. So I would say, if you're working out how to deal with all these problems, Build on what we have, as W. H. Auden once said about the Book of Common Prayer. Why spit on our luck? Well, um. ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we're past our time to end. I think we've had an extraordinary session from these three, and I really would like, on behalf of all of you, to thank you for the time, commitment, effort, humour that you've put into this conversation. So, can we show our appreciation <laughs> to the panel? Yes. I, just, I, just want to, I just want to conclude by saying that this has been a tremendous series of events and, uh, as I said at the beginning, very much due to Linda's drive and leadership. And for, to those of you who've asked about the future, we have been thinking actively about continuing this series of activities in the spring of next year, and we'll give you more information about that in due course when we've finalised exactly what we're going to do. But thank you all again for coming this evening, and thank you again to our panel. Thank you very much.